hey, here we are. Um, what, what are the uh, what are the odds? So, so this is a, a quick webcast, and I say quick; it's an hour long webcast, but quick for what we're going to cover. Um, and uh, I had to limit it to five Windows forensic artifacts, right? Um, and uh, let's discuss a little bit about Windows and forensics generally. And Ian mentioned that I would introduce myself. Currently, I work as an independent security researcher. I used to be a SANS instructor. Uh, let's see, I work as I'm at IONS faculty, or work at IONS as a faculty member. Also used to, uh, used to hack a little bit, right? And so uh, for the government, and hope to leave all that behind. And then some, some fun Russian folks, the Shadow Brokers, outed me uh, pretty, uh, that was not awesome. But anyway, uh, I've been called a digital terrorist, a breaker of software. Uh, gosh, let's see, responder to incidents. I do some malware reversing occasionally. Uh, spaces are better than tabs. Sorry, if you disagree, you're just wrong. I disagree. I just very much dislike anybody who calls himself a thought leader. Listen, if if you have to call yourself a thought leader, that that's yeah. Somebody else calls you a thought leader, rock on, right? But the people who walk on, yeah, I'm I'm a thought leader. I'm like, oh, goodness, that that can't possibly be accurate. And then of course blockchain, right? If you're needlessly adding blockchain to an otherwise good solution, uh, you and I are going to have words, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about scope. All right. I've got an hour to cover just a few artifacts. I probably won't cover your favorite. It's statistically likely that I won't if you do a bunch of forensics. Right? Um, so I want to get that one out of the way here. If, if you want to learn more about forensic artifacts, come take the class, uh, Advanced Endpoint Investigations, and we will deep dive further than we will here for sure into uh, some forensic artifacts as well. If you want to debate wh which ones I pick, by all means, do it Deadwood. Right, come on to Deadwood uh, for Wild West Hacking Fest, and we'll do it there. Speaking of Deadwood, I don't know if anybody was at ShmooCon. Uh, Grifter, a uh, fantastic uh, gentleman, and uh, thankfully a uh, friend, brought a box of Batman cereal sealed from 1989 uh, to ShmooCon. It was fantastic. Now, I have to confess that I missed round one and didn't see round one. and. Uh, Grifter manages to come over. It's a little bit after midnight, maybe 1230-ish. I don't know. I'm in a different area of the lobby over there. I heard some ruckus, but didn't know what, what was going on. And uh, comes over and he's like, hey, want some cereal? And I'm like, yeah, totally. And, and it wasn't awesome. It was horrific. It's the only, only way I can, can even describe it is, is, is rancid. Right? I think rancid is probably it. And uh, so I was chatting with Mr. Strand actually a little bit um, about this uh, on a, a webcast with some red team rants and, and whatnot. And uh, he's like, oh yeah. And he's like, missed out on that. Darn. So anyway, forget the low quality picture, but I've secured another box that will be coming with us to Deadwood um, and uh, from 1989, right? You know, now whatever that works out to be, what, eight months later. So uh, join me for part two and uh, we will see if we can raise some Maybe raise some money for charity because John has already pretty much said he's not going to do it. But I'm pretty sure if we raise some money for charity, he'll absolutely eat a box of rot or box. He'll absolutely try uh, some rotten cereal, right? And of course, anybody who else who's out there, uh, you are also welcome to try some of this awesomeness. Um, and uh, yes, but I'm taking the Batman bank home. There, there's just no question about that. Um, so anyway, um, by the way. Fun fact that I learned that night as well, there's apparently only one Batman in the history of the Batman franchise um, that uh, where their bat suit had nipples. I, I was unaware of this, but, but who knew, right? Um, so, anywho, moving forward, right? This is the agenda for today, right? Since we're moving away from Batman's nipples and moving into uh, the, certainly our agenda. Um, First off, I want to talk about why did I pick five forensic artifacts besides just the length of the webcast, right? That certainly, that's a uh, um, certainly that's that's a joke, right? Um, in in that you know in that sense, but also, you know, I, I I do want to note here that that we are inundated with more and more forensic artifacts every day, right? And so that's going to play into the why of the five. And then these are the five we're going to discuss. So if you're like, man, I know everything about these, then rock right on out. Uh, otherwise, we'll be discussing these and a little bit of what I'm looking for in some of these. Again, although I want to note, we are speed running, um, you know, really that many uh, that many artifacts through. Right. So why do we start with five? All right. Well, every month there's some. I don't want to call it a new discovery, but publication of right. 
um, you know, some new forensic artifacts that we should be looking at, right? Potentially be looking at, depending on your case type. But man, keeping up with all this stuff is, is a challenge in itself. But going beyond just keeping up with it, right? I now have more context for my investigation, which is good until you step back and ask, am I getting more time to do those investigations? And the answer there typically is, no, we're not, right? We're not getting more time to process what now are more artifacts, right? And so we end up having to do a lot more prioritization. I, I remember rolling back in the uh, way back in, in Sans Forensics class. This is well over a decade. I never taught this version of it, by the way. But uh, when it was like one forensics class, right? And, and they were spending a solid day on, hey, you know, like, bring your own hard drive to image, right? Kind of thing. Like, that was such a big deal, right? Um, and now there's like multiple, and, and you know, obviously an anti siphon as well. I just roll back to SANS because back in the day, they were really the only ones doing that forensics training. Forensics has expanded so much, right? No course anywhere is covering everything that you need to know about forensics to complete every type of investigation. Um, you know, I, I can tell you for, for certain that, you know, in a lot of investigations, I end up writing my own software, right? Um, and by the way, if you need to know how to do that, hook up with Joff because he has, he's done a lot of that work. I know both in uh, Python um, and I believe he has a regular expressions class. And he was learning regular expressions is an amazing, like an amazing way for you to, uh, uh, well, I, I hate to use the words level up, but really to change your game, right? Um, so anyway, rolling forward here, I just want to note again that you are going to have to prioritize the data that's going to provide the best outcome given your investigation goals. I always, when I go into forensic analysis, whether it's you know, for an insider case, um, whether it's you know, for litigation support, what have you, it's, it's always a matter of what is it that we're trying to do here, right? What am I looking to do? And uh, you know, what questions are we trying to answer? Because when you frame it that way, it's not forensicate at all, it's provide decision support, right? And when, once you look at it from a decision support standpoint, it makes it a little bit easier to start doing artifact selection because, you know, again, either an artifact contributes to the type of questions our stakeholders will need to answer or it doesn't, right? In which case, okay, find something else, right? So let's talk about artifact number one, file system analysis. Oldie but goodie, right? Um, I can't think of an investigation that I've done in the last many years where I haven't wanted a file system timeline. They don't always come, but I'd like a file system timeline. Now, there's a lot of different places to go look for this stuff. Every file system, by the way, has its own nuance. We're going to focus on Windows, which means we're going to focus on NTFS, right? So, oh, no new artifacts. I saw somebody make a joke there. No new artifacts for Hunter Biden's laptop, right? I'm going to spend about, I'm going to spend a minute here. and I'm going to zig out because somebody, zig left here because somebody, uh, somebody brought that up. For, for those that don't know, I, I did the Hunter Biden laptop analysis for Washington Post. I, I think that was a joke there based on that. But if not, that, that, that was indeed the case. And I'll be the first to tell you that, that I did very little work in commercial forensic software utilities because the questions we were trying to answer are not the kind of questions that they typically, um, you know, the, the, those forensic software packages uh, typically are geared to provide the answers for. Um, and I ended up writing my own software uh, for that, uh, you know, for that analysis. Um, because we were building up a lot of analysis and bumped into weird file system issues and due to the way drives were copied, et cetera. And, and I'm still under a, a gag order, uh, but we'll eventually be able to talk about the technical analysis or the technical components of that analysis in detail. Um, anyway, rolling forward, right? Past that, we're on Windows today, not, not Mac, right? And uh, <clears throat> Windows, again, we're looking primarily at NTFS. Uh, which legacy-wise stands for New Technology File System. Um, but I'm, I'm looking for the uh, analysis for timestamps. Uh, we start with the master file table, the MFT. But we also have this log file, just transactional. We have the USN journal, which is update sequence number. And then we have these dollar sign I30. These are directory files. They are actually files that that basically represent a directory. And so all of these things can be parsed, right? And, and I'll bring up volume shadow copy a couple of times during the, uh, you know, during our discussion. Uh, note that that's yet another thing I need to deal with, right? Because as volume shadow copy is enabled on most Windows systems, right? 
um, I probably have duplicate copies of these artifacts that I can then use to look in the different volume shadow copies and do a view of the past. How do these artifacts exist in the past? And so I can use those. Also fantastic, right? It also means a lot more work, right? Because having the ability to do it is great. Now the question is, do I have a duty to perform that analysis? It's potentially exculpatory evidence. Now, I'm not working for law enforcement or anything. So, you know, if you happen to be, maybe you take a different look at that, right? Um, but anyway, you get the idea here, right? It means a lot more data to process. It's, both, it's a double-edged sword, a good and a bad thing simultaneously. Now, I need to mention here MACB, right? Uh, MACB, these are the, a lot of folks talk about like the creation and modified and access time. Well, okay, first off, right? Um, I prefer the MACB uh, format or I say format, but that, that kind of thought process there. And anytime I hear a C time, that's not a creation time. Please update that in your mind to like a change time. It's the time metadata changed on a given file, right? B, the birth time, right, is when the file was ultimately created. Now, a lot of file systems don't even have a B time. NTFS thankfully does. Um, so we know when a file was created. And so that's created, born, what, whatever the right word that you would like to use there happens to be. Of great importance, right? and I want to show you an example of this in a second, um, but of great importance when we start thinking about NTFS um, is the fact that there are multiple copies of these MACB timestamps in every file record. So our master file table, or MFT, is separated in what we call file records. And Excuse me. Um, every uh, file record then has multiple sets of these timestamps. The first one comes in a field called standard information. These are the ones you would see in Windows Explorer or the normal timestamps, right? Um, now, I get it. You don't see the metadata change time. That's the one you don't see. And Microsoft, confusingly, calls it creation time, right, instead of birth time, right? So just bear in mind there, you know, in your, um, your Explorer view, you can see those three, right? And then Want to note here though, there's a dollar sign file name timestamp as well. These get populated when the file's created, but they almost are never modified. There's no Windows API to go and mess with the dollar sign file name timestamps. There are for, you know, like set file time, for instance, right? You can use that to go and change the timestamps and standard information, but you can't do it for dollar sign file name, right? Now, some anti forensics tools will actually go in and read the dollar sign file. And this is them manually editing the MFT, which is fraught with danger, by the way, but is something they can do. And then they have to remember, indeed, to go and get both of the dollar sign file name timestamps if they're going to go modify anything. Of course, there's other advanced techniques we can use to even detect that. But I just wanted to mention here that there are two, normally, two additional copies of those MACB timestamps in the given file record one for the standard or long file name, and then the other one that fits into the 8.3 format, right? Um, and so, so we'll typically have a short uh, file name and a long file name. Um, so these are really useful in detecting timestamp manipulation um, and, and even unintentional timestamp manipulation. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by unintentional, right? Or, or let's call it non-malicious, benign uh, timestamp manipulation, right? So how do we do this analysis in the first place? Well, I, I mean, you could go in Right, and you could go read the MFT um, with, with, you know, like a hex editor, right? Um, and, and if you are an absolute, uh, you know, masochist, by all means, uh, you should do that, right? Um, I, I don't recommend it personally. Um, I, I personally prefer to use a tool to go parse that data out um, instead of looking at uh, 143,000 some odd records uh, in, in hex. And this is a small MFT. Um, this MFT, just for reference. Um, is from a Windows 11 system that was uh, built two days ago, something like that. Um, it, it's built this week, right? So like this thing has not seen a lot of use. Um, it, it's it's a demo system. Anytime I'm pulling forensic artifacts, 100%. It's it's a it, the system has only been used for that period because man, the amount of stuff that you can lose track of in a registry hive or a woo, you don't want any of that, right? So. Uh, no crossing the streams, as the Ghostbusters would say. Um, so now Zimmerman also provides a tool, uh, <clears throat> free, free tool, by the way, uh, open source, no less, uh, called Timeline Explorer. And this displays CSV files in a way more convenient format than Excel, right? Um, now, there are obviously tons of tools for CSV. 
Timeline Explorer was built to process large data sets quickly, right? You know, and it doesn't do a bunch of computations like Excel does, right? But but if you've ever tried to filter large data sets in Excel, oh my gosh, right? Yikes, what a giant pain. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that there were two, uh, two timestamps. Now, the MFTE command, right, that created this output that we load into Timeline Explorer, doesn't call them standard information and dollar sign file name. Um, it turns out that this 0x10 means 16 bytes into the file record is where the standard information sits, right? Standard information record sits. And so uh, as a result, this created 0x10 is the birth time, right? And the Mac being right is the birth time um, for our for our standard information. Now, if I look back here, remember I told you I installed this this week, right? Uh, Monday night, actually, for for the uh, for what it's worth, for Monday afternoon, evening, um, and you'll note here that there are a lot of created times, right, um, that are back in 2022. How did that happen, right? Well, this is me installing 7-Zip, right, um, and so when I run the 7-Zip installer, right, um, it turns out that the uh, ultimately that the installer, right, is uh, as it's writing the files, it's it's basically copying them with the installer itself. It's not something they had to code in, but the Windows installer with the packaged files, right? It takes their timestamps and copies those in standard information, typically, right? Now, again, there's lots and lots and lots of nuance here, but it's not uncommon to see something like this. And this wasn't a malicious modification, right? And so, but what you are seeing over here then is the 0x30, right? 0x30 is your dollar sign file name. Okay. Um, and so for your dollar sign file name uh, records here, uh, we do see indeed that those are the correct time, right? So these are uh, what 7-Zip was installed uh, this morning, it looks like. So 7-Zip uh, installed this morning uh, versus the MFT, and I grabbed screenshots this morning for this stuff, but the uh, versus the MFT record for standard information, you know, uh, ultimately having been modified. So I can look at this and say, well, hey, there are no Windows APIs here. This is real ground truth on, on when this is when this was actually created, right? And of course, we have the rest of the timestamps here. They just don't fit well in the uh, you know that screenshot uh, screenshot format. I do see a, a question here. If I can post a link to download the Timetable Explorer tool, if you go in and uh, do a quick search for uh, Eric Zimmerman tools, you'll find the whole list of his forensic tools, um, and it's it's way 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 more than we're talking about, here, right? way more he's got like 20 or 30 different tools out there that, that parse so they're all freeware which is which is great um you know for, for this <laughs>